Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another exciting TIES webinar. We are thrilled to have Prasanta Chakrabarti here. He is a professor of evolutionary biology and curator of fishes at LSU. He's going to do a great presentation. If you have questions for him, type them in to the chat box below. And after his presentation, I'm going to do a quick four-minute presentation about TIES and its sister education units. And then I will be announcing the two random teacher winners who receive a copy of his brand new book, Explaining Life Through Evolution. And then I will address all of your questions to him. And with that, Prasanta, you can take it away. Sure, thanks, Kenny. <clears throat> and thank you all for, for coming here today and, and watching either live or I guess recorded later. Um, does anybody, I'd like to be a little interactive. Does anybody know uh, what this video that's playing is for you evolution folks? Since you are teaching evolution, maybe you know this, this video. You can just unmute and say, since I can't see the chat. You guys have the ability to unmute yourself right now if you want to participate. There'll be other questions. <laughs> Anybody? It's from uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmos. It was one of his evolution videos. It's a little bit modified from the original in terms of splitting and showing uh, not just one species turning into another, but the bifurcation that we expect in a phylogenetic tree. Um, so I wanted to start by uh, dedicating the talk to Black and Natural History Museums. Uh, it's Black and Natural History Museum week in uh, a few days. And um, it's the third uh, Black and Natural History Museums week. And um, I just want to say why this is important to me personally. So um, when there are events like this, um, sometimes we think, oh, you know, you know, someone might ask, why do we need such a thing? During the first Black and Natural History Museum week, I, I sort of did a deep dive in my own collections. And thanks to my first uh, graduate student, Valerie Darrowian, uh, who's an African-American, she told me about Albert Doucette, who was the first African-American uh, to graduate with a, gra with a graduate degree from my department, from biological sciences and, and from the museum. And, you know, just looking up, like, what he did, uh, especially in our collections, it turns out, you know, sort of spurred on from my research because it was the first Black and Natural History Museums week, Turns out he collected more than 10% of the specimens in the, in the collections that I curate. And I didn't know about that. And it was too bad. And, and that's not something that uh, will happen again. Now I know that Albert Doucette was an important collector for the collections that I curate and for Louisiana in general. So that's why we do things like that. And so I, I encourage all of you to look up Black and Natural History Museums. Um, and I'll be talking about natural history quite a bit throughout this talk. Um, to further that, you know, uh, um, part of my book includes um, some cartoons and some images. And one of the people that, you know, we has often been ignored, one of those hidden figures in evolutionary biology is John Edmundstone, who I think many of you should know and know now, but who probably wasn't somebody we learned about 10, 15, 20 years ago, but probably should be tied to Darwin as much as uh, Wallace or, or uh, Hooker or any of the other uh, historical figures that lived and, and influenced Darwin. So John Edmundstone, if you don't know, was a, a formerly enslaved person that moved to London as a free, free man. He was uh, a black um, taxidermist. And um, in that role, he taught Charles Darwin how to do taxidermy on, on mammals and birds. And because he grew up in South America and worked in South America and was enslaved in South America, he had tales of that land. And we can imagine during their many hours together learning and, and teaching, uh, uh, Darwin learning and Edmundstone teaching that uh, he told him and regaled him about these times in South America. And this is before Darwin graduated from college. This is before the Beagle. And we can see that line of, of um, of understanding that maybe Edmundston maybe influenced Darwin to go to the Beagle and to go to South America in the first place. And perhaps without Edmundston, 
there is no voyage of the beagle and then there's no origin of species and we don't talk about Darwin. So uh, another hidden figure from the past, um, just something to think about during the upcoming Black and Natural History Week. So um, I'll be interactive again. Hopefully some of you win my book. Um, thanks to MIT Press for sending, uh, I think, 10 copies to, to, uh, to ties to give away. Um, so I'd like to ask if anybody, you know, uh, some of you are evolutionary biologists, but what does an evolutionary biologist do? And feel free to unmute and tell us. And if you participate, your chances of winning the book increase. Ooh. <laughs> I'll jump in here. Um, in my mind, evolutionary biologists do a lot, but most broadly, using uh, the lens of evolution to describe relationships between various groups of organisms. Sure, yeah, certainly one of the more important things we do. How do we do that? Ooh, lot, lots of ways, but certainly genetics, DNA, comparative anatomy, and on and on and on. Sure, and we will talk about all those things. Anybody else want to jump in or have a, a different view? You could win how about the fossil uh how about the fossil record since uh you know uh, animals live and then they die as they evolve so uh uh so bones and and, and other uh imprints and so on that uh that tell you about life that's not around anymore sure yeah those are both right and they're all kinds of evolutionary biologists and i am an evolutionary biologist and so uh this is me uh, me and my friend Shay in Tanzania, and we are collecting fishes in a mangrove habitat that he knows well. He's a local. Uh, he's a local who knows about the tides that come in. The tides come in and go up and down 10 feet every day. And I'm collecting gobies, and, and he's helping me. He knows these animals, but he might not know the scientific names. Um, but he's teaching me about the tides. I might be teaching him about um, what the different families of these groups are and, and what I know about them. And so he's sharing his local knowledge with me and I'm sharing my, my knowledge uh, with him. And so that's part of what I do. I'm an ichthyologist. I get to go to different parts of the world to collect animals like this. And that's part of what I'll talk about. But this is another place where that I consider my natural habitat. So this is uh, the collections here at LSU's Museum of Natural Science. Uh, LSU's Louisiana State University, to those of you who don't maybe follow the sports of uh, football or baseball or basketball. Um, but I've been here about 15 years. And these collections, I tell people that these aren't just jars of, of dead fish. These are data. They're data about evolutionary history, about ecological data. They can tell me how much mercury is in the water or was in the water at the time these animals were collected. They can tell me how the organisms have changed over time. That's why we don't just have one specimen of every species. They tell me about who collected these animals. So Shay's name, my name, go on the jars. So there's stories about these organisms and the time and the collecting too. And they're data about evolutionary history. They're not just dead fish. Um, but us natural historians, we speak for these specimens. So this is uh, Miranda Lowe, uh, the curator of crustaceans at the Natural History Museum in London. And so she's speaking about this giant isopod from the deep sea, uh, while I might be speaking about these fishes. And so the word voucher is about these preserved specimens, these data points, these access points for data that are in natural history collections. And the word voucher will come up at the end of the talk, too. So uh, remember that word. And what we use those specimens for and the data from them is to, in part, build phylogenetic trees, build systematic analyses where we can tell who's related to whom. And I do that with fishes. And so this is a tree of a group of cichlid fishes from South America. And on the bottom here, if you can see my cursor, is a fossil that we redescribed from Haiti. Uh, it's the oldest vertebrate fossil from anywhere in the Caribbean. And it helps date and time the lineage of the living things that are on this tree. So this tree includes fossil taxa, fossil species, and uh, living species. And they can help tell us when continents or land masses broke apart and separated. 
and they can tell us how old these groups are. Um, and from that, also, we can discover new species. So uh, very few times have I been in the field where I'm like, oh my god, this is new, uh, because I knew that nothing looked like it. And that includes this uh, cavefish on top here, which I knew right away that it was different. But most of the time, we're comparing these specimens on a phylogenetic tree or uh, with other collections that we have to see what doesn't quite fit with what we currently know in the Western scientific record of what species are described. And these are the new species I've described, about 15 or so. But what people don't know when we talk about the description of new species is that when you describe a new species, you're also modifying the tree of life. And so what you see on the sides here are new genera, a new genus being added, or a subfamily, but also revisions that we have to do. So as taxonomists, we're not just naming new species, we're changing the tree of life and how it's organized and may name new lineages on that tree. Um, but we do that for lots of things. So SARS-CoV-2 is, you know, our understanding of it is built from uh, this historical network, a phylogenetic network, telling us who is related to whom amongst these different strains that cause uh, COVID-19, right? And you can look on a phylogenetic tree how COVID is evolving and how SARS-CoV-2 is changing and evolving and moving through space and time and how it's uh, evolved and, and gained new um, mutations, et cetera, right? So it's not just vertebrates and animals like this, but viruses too. And when people talk about evolution, of course, people talk about um, our own history. So what's our closest relatives? Anybody want to say? Here's a clue on the board. Got to go here with the uh, chimpanzees and the bonobos. Mm -hmm. So those are our closest living relatives, right? And most people think of it like that. But what if we had all the living species in between us not just in between us, but that we're more closely related to. So our closest relatives are Neanderthals, Homo habilis, other members of our genus, Australopithecus. These are species that are much more closely related to us than we are with the split that's taken place 8 million years ago uh, that divided uh, us from our common ancestor with chimpanzees, right? So our closest living relatives are just a proxy uh, or of our understanding of our own evolution. While there's many extinct species uh, that um, in part reveal to us who we are and where we came from. And uh, a, a part of uh, evolutionary biology that you, you guys know as teachers of evolution that many people miss. And so, you know, this week we're also handing out Nobel Prizes and a reminder that last year's Nobel Prize in medicine and physiology went to Svante Pabo, who's an evolutionary biologist, right? And, and he won the prize for his sequencing of the genome of Neanderthals. And Neanderthals are an extinct human species, but there are some, still subfossils from which we can uh, obtain the genome or, or the entirety of the DNA from. Uh, and he did that. And... Uh, he also explained parts of what we can learn from that. So because uh, Homo sapiens, our species, has quite a bit of Neanderthal DNA, also um, he revealed that uh, with co-authors that Neanderthal DNA, the, uh, most of the people on this call have around 2% Neanderthal DNA, that those with high amounts of Neanderthal DNA um, are, were more susceptible to having severe COVID. Right, so that was a not just uh, an explanation of what the genome can tell us, but um, part of revealing our own history with Neanderthals too. And so um, Neanderthals went extinct uh, twenty thousand or so years ago, but part of their genomes exist in us human beings living today. And again, many of you still have about two percent uh, Neanderthal genomes in you, and that two percent is a lot more than you have even from your great, 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 great grandfather from six generations ago, which is less, which is on average less than 2%. So you don't have just one or two Neanderthal genome, uh, Neanderthal ancestors, you have many, and they all contributed a little bit to that 2%. And so, uh, but no worries if you, if you're worried, you could still be 2% Neanderthal and 100% American as the meme goes. And so uh, there's uh, not, those are not mutually exclusive. You can be both. 
Um, but when I teach evolution, you know, uh, often when we teach it, we we throw graphs like this, uh, which is pertaining to race and, and gene frequencies. Um, when I teach evolution, I also talk about and and I write about in my book about the spectra of uh, the um, the diversity of race and gender and sex and how that's on a spectrum, right? So I like to talk about the twins here. Uh, these twin girls um, were born of the same parents, just like every other twin. Uh, they uh, are the same age, obviously. What does it mean if one twin will check off a box if for race as black and one will check off a box for white? You know, what does race mean if twins can be different races? So um, I think about that and I think about how they may uh, express their sexuality and, and, and sex in different ways. So one may continue to uh, express her gender as, as female or, or as a girl and the other may not, right? And so what does that mean in terms of uh, their biology and in terms of how they express themselves? Right. So these are complicated factors that in the past, evolutionary biologists were on the dark side of explaining those things. They were on the side of, of racism and sexism and something that we also need to talk about when we talk about uh, the history of evolutionary biology. So um, I like to keep things more simple um, when it pertains to how the tree of life can tell us about where we came from. And so my big push and, and is always to say that, you know, when someone asks me where you're from, I say fish. And uh, we are a fish, our, we are vertebrates and all vertebrates are fishes. And so, you know, this very simplified phylogenetic tree shows that uh, we're on the tetrapod line of the lobe fin fishes line of the bony vertebrates. And one line of fishes went to land, one, land, one line of fishes continued out into the water. So even more simplified, so there's a cartilaginous group of vertebrates, and then there's a bony fish, the osteichthys, and one group of those, the sarcopterygians, are where we belong. And with coelacanths, we fit in this lineage here of, of lobed fin fishes. So you, you're a fish, but you're also an archaea, right? So if we look at the domains of life and we go even deeper, there's the bacteria and there's the archaea line. These are two trees showing you in the same way, the archaea here. But really, if you look, the eukaryotes, uh, the group of multi, mostly multicellular organisms or organisms with nuclei, they are on the archaea line. We are archaea too. So these uh, extremophile groups, we're an extremophile. We're weird to be a, a land-dwelling animal, a vertebrate. So we fit within the archaea line, but also we're phylogenetically archaea. So how do we make sense of all this? Well, you know, if we go back, Aristotle created this hierarchy, and he thought, you know, everything that existed existed as it was in the past, and will do so forever in perpetuity. And so they made this hierarchy of inanimate objects, fungi, plants all the way up to man in themselves. And then later on, people added angels and gods, etc. But when we think about how we organize uh, life on earth, you know, it's organized uh, in a way that is explained by evolution. So evolution is that explanation of the origins and diversity of life. And so one way of portraying that is this hierarchy, which is often, you know, why people think we're you're either a fish or you're an amphibian or you're a reptile or you're a bird or you're a mammal, when really we're all interconnected, right? So this Darwinian, this evolutionary view of the tree of life is the modern way of understanding where we're from. Uh, many of you know this, but I like to, to show how I explain it to folks. So what is the evidence for evolution? Well, there's molecular evidence. We're all connected by our DNA, RNA, um, how the tree of life is created or, or formed and explained is through that the changes in our DNA uh, throughout all of life. There's biochemical evidence, right? We use right-handed sugars and left-handed amino acids, even though left-handed sugars and right-handed amino acids exist. And all of life uh, on earth at least uses those, uh, those uh, 
isomers, but maybe life on other uh, parts of our universe may do something different, right? Uh, so connecting us through our biochemical usage. There's fossils, as I think Sam mentioned, so fossils that show the gaps between the living and the dead. And the observable ways that we can see things that have quick generation times, like bacteria, like SARS-CoV-2 evolved uh, quickly over time, uh, even within our lifespans, even within the time period of a graduate student's career. So uh, going back to fishes, I want to give you an example of something I'm studying that I'm, I'm excited because these are the first time I'm actually showing a bunch of these slides. But why do fish matter? Well, that's we are fish, right, as we've established. So why are we fish? Well, because a fish came onto land. Fishes came onto land, and that lineage gave rise to the tetrapods, all the vertebrates that live on land. And that starts, uh, as best we know, with the lineage that includes Tiktaalik. And Tiktaalik, we don't have video of Tiktaalik coming onto land. We don't even know for sure how much it could come onto land, or if it could walk. And part of my research today that I'll be talking about is understanding what we can tell from the anatomy of Tiktaalik and, and these fossil creatures from living species. Uh, how much can we infer about their abilities from the fossil record or from their anatomy? And so I, I love this meme. This is uh, somebody waving a stick at Tiktaalik and sending this 400 million year old Devonian fish back into the water. Right. If someone were doing that, of course, the who that person is would have to have come from the future. But sending Tiktaalik back into the water would mean no tetrapods, no humans uh, somewhere further down the line. Right. So Tiktaalik's a real thing. This is me at the Canadian Museum of Nature. Their uh, collections are in, in Quebec. And this looks small. This is a, a fossil, the type fossil of Tiktaalik. Uh, this uh, fossil from the Canadian Arctic, uh, one of the earliest tetrapodomorphs that gave rise to, that was on the lineage that gave rise to tetrapods. Uh, there are many specimens of Tiktaalik, uh, so there's not just one, not just this one. There are nine, some are over nine feet long, and so they're pretty big. Um, and I'm showing you this fish. So this is a balladoured loach, and it reminded me of Tiktaalik. So fish don't grab onto sticks and climb up. This is a video taken from my friend, uh, Zach Randall. And so I became interested in these balladoured loaches that live in fast dwelling streams in uh, in Thailand and other places. And so just walking, watching it again, this fish is clinging onto the stick with seemingly fins that are very hand-like. Uh, and this is the extreme example of that morphology. This is uh, Cryptotora the so-called cave angel. This is a CT scan with the purple showing its unique or uh, unique to that family anyway, connection of the vertebral column to the pelvic girdle. And that's a hip. And fish don't have hips. The tictal, uh, 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 cryptotara, the cave angel does. And so do its closest relatives. And so the CT scan and uh, this species got us interested in, in learning about how much the anatomy can tell us about um, some species that lived much earlier. So this is a convergence with some of the earliest tetrapods from the Devonian period, 400 million years ago. It is not a sarcopterygian. It is not a lobed fin fish. It's a bony fish, uh, but a ray fin fish that seemingly has recreated some of that convergence. So we went to Thailand, we spent a lot of time in caves. This is my PhD student at the time. She's now a professor at University of Alabama. This is Pam Hart looking at the two specimens of Cryptotara in the water in a cave in Thailand. Uh, she became an evolutionary biologist because of this species. So I was, it's a very proud PI moment for me when uh, I got to take her to the cave where they live. These are my Thai colleagues here. This smoke is actually somebody smoking we spent six hours in this cave. We we're eating lunch there. We we're very muddy, but it was wonderful and beautiful because we got to see this creature. So this is uh, Cryptotara again. So they swim and they climb up waterfalls. They're blind. They don't have any pigments. They're amazing. <laughs> There's uh, you could see them, and they're doing this walk 
of this very salamander gait. So they're walking back and forth where you can see the, the hind portions are actually moving, alternating uh, like a salamander would walk. And so they have pretty cr incredible abilities to walk up waterfalls in caves. Mm. And uh, this video uh, is sort of, I'm, I'm showing this because when you take a GoPro video, the default setting is to add music and this is the music it thought it fit with with the uh, cryptotara. <laughs> so I always like showing that as a as a joke. That was the first video we saw of Cryptotara had that video, that music playing. Uh, and then outside of the cave, you can see them walking outside of the water too. And so still having the salamander gait. If you can see me doing this, they have this walk like a salamander does. It is not a salamander. It's a fish. And Tiktaalik wasn't a salamander either. Right? They continue being fish uh, forever. So uh, that reminded me too, just seeing this of one of the last lines in, in Darwin's uh, Descent of Man. He says, man still bears in his bodily frame the indelible stamp of his lowly origin. And I hate that line because it's a diss for fishes. And so if you look at this human skeleton walking, it's, it's, it, it hurts to look at, right? Knee scraping against femur, uh, elbows dangling everywhere, the only plantigrade biped, it's just hard, right? I'm standing right now, but I bet most of you are sitting, right? It's just a much more comfortable position. And so think of that line that came onto land and walked uh, and fighting gravity like we are without a tail even to stabilize us compared to this nice ray fin fish on the left here or my left, uh, which stayed in the water. This is the group that didn't come onto land, that wasn't part of Tiktaalik's line or the other sarcopterygians. Teleost means end bone, and that's the advanced version of, of how uh, fishes could remain when they remained in the water, a body built for aquatic life, not a scraping by with uh, bending and folding these bones into what we have today. Um, so we don't have video of Tiktaalik walking, right? It's We just have models of it, and we can sort of predict how it could have walked based on the anatomy of it, but not really. But we do have uh, quite a bit of mechanisms to better understand uh, point by point how these organisms alive today are walking and, and how they're using their anatomy to do so. Uh, so this is some of the work um, we co-authored and that was led by Callie Crawford, um, who was in Brooke Fleming's lab then. And so we're looking now at Cryptotara in the middle here and its closest relatives and their anatomy. So there's some CT scans that were done, uh, mostly at the University of Florida with our, our colleagues there and Larry Page's lab and looking at how this anatomy changes and has changed in different close members of this cave angel. Um, and a lot of these were filmed in that same time that we filmed Cryptotora. We're catching ballotoids in the rivers and filming them walking. Uh, and so these CT scans that we did after that our colleagues here is a video from Zach Randall again, or uh, that you can see the CT scans, you could zoom in. So this is part of evolutionary research today, right? Like you can use uh, genomes and you can use CT scanning to better understand this close an anatomy uh, in, in diverse parts of the tree of life. And, um, you know, most fishes have this kind of anatomy. There's no connection between the vertebral column, which has ribs, to the pelvic girdle, so the, the part that would become your legs, right? And so we have this connection, and so do some of the members of this balatorid loach lineage, but in different ways. So they've broken this up into three categories, and Cryptotara has this and what's called M3 or, or very robust connection between the vertebral column and the pelvic girdle, much more so than Tiktaalik did. Uh, Tiktaalik was not even at level one, uh, but getting close to it, had longer ribs for sure, and maybe some ligaments. And so even if we compare uh, the, uh, this connection between uh, the ribs and, and the vertebral column and the uh, pelvic girdle, there's significant differences even within the family Balatoridae. And it goes back and forth. It's not that all members 
um, of one lineage have one type of connection. And then we can look at how they walk. And the prediction would be that those with the most robust uh, ribs and this anatomy would have be the best walkers, right? You would assume that the things that lived 400 million years ago with the most robust um, anatomy around their pelvic girdle would be the best walkers. But it turned out when we looked at um, how functionally these work and compared them to the anatomy, that the ones with the most robust parts of their body weren't not necessarily the best walkers, didn't have the most clear uh, gait there. So uh, the connection is important, but uh, the most robust ones didn't mean they were the best walkers. Some of them are still swimmers, right? So that tells us part of the story of, of how we can understand fossils like Tiktaalik and how they walk. Maybe we need to, to know a little bit more than we do now. It can't all be inferred just from anatomy. So uh, this is another video that Zach uh, and his undergrads were actually made. Um, where we try to infer, you know, how Tiktaal uh, how Cryptotora walked, and this is uh, the fossil uh, holotype of um, of Tiktaalik again on the top left. So again, you know, inferring anatomy, uh, inferring function from anatomy isn't always as clear as as we always we hope it to be. Right? It takes a little bit of a deeper dive. You know, need to know about sometimes you need to know about ligaments and other connections. So we also recently sequenced the genome, so the entirety of the DNA from Cryptotara, which was not an easy task. Um, I could tell you a few things about it and then it'll give you an insight in how we understand genomes in general. So we know a lot about human genomes. We don't know a lot about uh, animal and plant genomes or fungi, fungal genomes. So we know that Cryptotara is a pretty small genome, about 500 million base pairs or, or close to 600 million base pairs, which is pretty small for a fish genome. Most of those are uh, you know, 1 billion base pairs. We have 3 billion base pairs. And then there are things like apples that have a lot more. Uh, so there's not a clear, like, you know, how many uh, base pairs there should be in a particular organism. But we do know that this genome is particularly small for Cryptotara. And cave fishes, sometimes people predict that cave fishes have a small genome because they've lost color and they've lost pigmentation and They've lost sight in their eyes. So maybe they have a smaller genome. That's not always the case. Some cave fishes have a, a much bigger genome than their sighted relatives. So other things we can tell you from the genome, they have lots of duplications. There's 126 genes that have duplicated uh, a number of times, up to four or 500 uh, duplications in total of genes that we looked at, but lots of deletions, almost 6,000 deletions of genes that are probably important to their close relatives. So some of these include uh, vision genes, including rhodopsin, which is an important opsin for sight. But another opsin gene was duplicated, and that's one that's important for hormone, hormone regulation. Another one that's missing that explains the pigment loss is MC1R, which is a common one that's lost in, in albino animals and cave animals. There are also Hox genes that are missing, and Hox genes tell us about the direction that um, different uh, body parts will be formed on the body, right? So you can't scramble these Hox, uh, these major Hox uh, genes. But even with that loss, we didn't see any common limb or fin genes uh, that weren't in the right place. It seems like it was intact and correct. So we don't know. That was one of the, our hypotheses that Hox mutations might explain uh, that vertebral connection to the pelvic girdle. We saw some duplication in genes important in development and also clock genes. So these are animals that live in caves 24 hours in darkness. There's no light. They haven't seen the light of day ever. And so it's not surprising that many cave fishes lose these circadian rhythm pathways, clock genes that help us wake up in the morning, right? Your internal clock uh, helps tell you and recognize day from night and what time it is. So those genes are lost in this species, which is probably not surprising. Then there are things like the insulin genes uh, duplicated. Why? We don't know yet, right? And there aren't close relatives of Cryptotara that have their genome sequenced yet, and we're working on that too. Uh, so we will do that soon and compare them, and that will help us better, better understand these losses to see if they're in the close relative. Another thing you can look at how these genes are related to, 
each other. And there are quite a few of these that are related to reduction in oxidation, redox genes. And we don't know why those are uh, deleted necessarily or why they were linked. But we also see this link in blue here to the circadian rhythm genes and loss in color genes uh, within this sort of statistical analysis of, of gene loss. So I just want to end with a few slides about the role of museums in genomics. So evolutionary biologists like myself, you know, some of us are natural historians who are doing lots of field work, uh, but we also work in labs doing genomics, like we talk about. And museums are important in that role. Sometimes people think of museums as being, you know, the place that we were dusting off dinosaurs, and we're doing a lot more than that, especially in modern research museums. First, I, I like to think of genomics as natural history. So uh, publishing the human genome is descriptive work. Just like I describe species, new species, sometimes I describe the genome of a new fish. So we describe, we put out the genome of the bluegill sunfish a couple months ago, right? That was descriptive. This is the bluegill genome. Here you go, right? And here's this new species. Here you go. Human genome's the same. So it's very much natural history. And you can look at parts of the genome like we did that's very much similar to what we do in, in descriptive natural history work. But there are a lot more genomes and genome information about human beings and our, our differences in populations, even though we're very, very, very similar. We have a lot fewer genomes, you know, less than 10,000 total genomes for plants, animals, and fungi, which is a lot less than many people would predict. Unfortunately, what I, you know, I think about the specimens. So a lot of the genomes, the majority, the vast majority, almost 90% of the genomes that have been published uh, up to 2021 when we published this paper don't have a reference voucher. That means there's no way to go back and re-identify something for which there's a genome in case we change the taxonomy or in case there's some question about where that genome actually came from, it would be hard to track back and reproduce that data, which I think is a big a crisis in genomics that people don't talk about. So again, those vouchers that link to specimen is part of what we do. So that bio curation that I, uh, I try to advocate for, that is part of evolutionary biology, right? Where do we put the metadata on the tree of life? The tree of life tells us who's related to whom, but it could also tell us how characters on that tree change over time. And so putting the data the phenotypic data, et cetera, needs to be part of what curators do, curating the metadata. And so uh, we've talked about CT scans and MRIs, and we've talked about um, genomes and collecting in the field and vouchers, and all that information should be hung as metadata on this tree of life, right? Otherwise, it's just a tree of relationships, which is important, but we need to know how things are changing on that tree, not just the names. It's not just names, it's organisms. And then if we add fossils to that, right, we're putting this context of deep time on the tree. And when we do that, we can start unzipping the tree. We can start saying, how are things changing over time? These different epochs, what has changed over time if we include the fossils with the living? And then all the metadata too. So just to wrap up, um, the study of evolutionary biology includes everything from genomics to natural history and everything in between and well beyond. And there is an interplay, interplay between those. We need to understand evolution to understand our own history as humans, right? You know, we're bacteria, we're archaea, we're, we're fish, we're mammals, we're vertebrates. And so that's part of our understanding that we need this context for. And then I, I showed you, a, I think, a, a neat project that we've been working on recently on a very cool fish, Cryptotara. Uh, so Cryptotara is a cool fish that can tell us about tetrapod adaptations in a non-tetrapod. It's convergently uh, found another way to get the salamander gate. And then it can tell us and reveal that, you know, some of the early tetrapods were they able to walk on land or not? It might be more complicated than even we think from the anatomy of the past. So with that, I'll, I'll thank all of you for, for listening to me. Uh, thanks for those of you who've read the book and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about uh, what you think about the book. But uh, this is a great 
um, group, the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. I, I love teaching evolution. I've taught some of the uh, biggest classes in, in the US evolution, uh, teach it every other year and love it. So thank you for all of you for teaching evolution and, and helping people understand evolution. And you can reach out to me at the, the contact on the right there. So thank you all for what you do and thanks for listening to me. So once again, thank you, Prasanta Chakrabarti for that presentation on expanding life through evolution. The presentation, the webinar was for TIES, which is the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. I guess I should say I'm Kenny Coogan. I'm the CFI Education Coordinator. So the Center for Inquiry has three educational programs, one of which is TIES, and we're going to be talking about the other two in just a minute. TIES has been around since 2015. We've presented over 300 workshops in all 50 states. Our website is TIESeducation.org. The idea for all three of our education programs is teachers helping teachers. All of our resources are free. Almost all of our resources are in Word and PowerPoint because we want you to edit our resources. We want you to put your name on it and we want you to modify it to meet your students' needs. We are on social media. We are on Twitter, we are on Facebook, and we are on YouTube. For YouTube, I've created playlists that are by theme or like thematic curriculum. So there's one on human evolution, there's one on natural selection, there's one on genes. So you can just go to those playlists when you're teaching those units in middle school and high school and kind of go through that. And all of our fantastic webinars are also listed on our YouTube page. To see uh, the upcoming webinars, you can definitely go to tieseducation.org or you can go to our Facebook event. And uh, this event, as well as at least one more coming up, uh, the publisher is the MIT Press, and they've been so gracious enough to donate some books for us to give away at our live webinars and in our in-person uh, teacher programs. So earlier, before the this webinar, we were talking about our book, which is called On Teaching Evolution. It was written by members of the TIES who have tackled the topic of evolution in their classrooms for decades. So if you add up all of the teachers, we have hundreds of years, maybe 200 years worth of teaching evolution in there. And it offers practical advice and sample lesson plans for fellow science teachers. And the cool thing about the book is that there's QR codes throughout the chapters that say what our favorite uh, bell ringers are, or icebreakers, our favorite lessons, our favorite labs. Don't feel the need that you have to purchase the book because all of our resources are free on our website. The foreword was written by Richard Dawkins. And just for you guys, we are having a BOGO sale. Buy one, get one free. So that means you can buy one and then you can gift the other copy to your favorite teacher or library. Another program that we have is Science Saves. Science Saves is a nine partisan nonpartisan effort to promote science appreciation by highlighting the many ways science has unleashed human potential, transformed our lives, and given us the tools to overcome all manners of challenges. So here we have K through 12 lessons in all disciplines about how science has really improved our lives. One of my favorite lessons is the one about child mortality. If you have to have your kids graph something, why not? Why not it be child mortality and us washing our hands or us using uh, vaccines? And then the last one is Generation Skeptics. This program aims to develop and foster an understanding of the world through inquiry-based learnings. We want to promote critical thinking, skeptical thinking. We have lessons that you can integrate in all of your curriculum. We have lessons on ghost hunting. We have lessons. Uh, um, lots of different things, but one of my favorite aspects is that the if you are looking for a skeptic to zoom into your classroom, like on attachment theory or magic or uh, supernatural things, we will connect you with an expert. And that would be a great, you know, it's October. Think of this for Halloween, but also year round. Like Prasant said, thanks to MIT, they've donated 10 books. We're going to give away two tonight. And then the other uh, eight we're going to give away in our in-person workshops. 
And the lucky winners are Kathy R and Aaron. So please send me a private message right now with your address and I will ship you explaining life through evolution. Has Tiktaalik genome been sequenced? Is there any DNA available to do so? No, we only have fossils from Tiktaalik and, and fossils <clears throat> from the Devonian and that long ago are all stone. So all the mineral has been replaced. And so there's no more DNA in it, unfortunately. Uh, so we can't bring Tiktaalik back or, or sequence its genome. And the only reason, again, we could with Neanderthals is their bones in some of the caves where they died and maybe lived uh, have not turned to fossils yet. Those are sub fossils. So uh, through painstaking work, they were able to sequence those. But Tiktaalik is long, long, long dead uh, and no organic material remains. Did you say how many Tiktaalik fossils there were? Uh, dozens, a dozen. I know I've seen three, but there's more. And, and the lay person. All... What's can that? The, can the lay person see one? A real one? Ooh. Uh, you have to ask the Canadian. They're all the Canadian <laughs> Museum of Nature, uh, okay. of which I was a, um, uh, a research associate. So they're not on display. They're like back in the collection. So All you, right. you got to know somebody. <laughs> well, we know you now. So <laughs> um, for some reason, I booked the webinars and it's always during the school year. For some reason, the theme for the fall semester is fish, aquatic life. We talked about uh, aminoids, squid, octopus. And now you're talking all about fish. And John would like to know. He's curious about the impacts of the KT extinction event on marine and freshwater fishes. We hear all about the dinosaurs, but really of uh, many of the other major groups. Yeah, it was actually, so I'm teaching ichthyology, the study of fishes this semester. And I always ask students about this and uh, ducks and horses, their earliest fossil record is about 50 million years ago, 40 million years ago. Um, and that's about the time that most fishes living today uh, diversified. So the biggest group of fishes are the teleos. I showed you the skeleton of a teleos fish. That's a ray fin fish with suction feeding. Uh, I think the perfect animal. Teleos means perfect bone or end bone. And most of them diversified after the KT boundary and may have uh, diversified because of that boundary. Uh, maybe pretty quickly after that. Our most recent papers and, and trees uh, from that time show sort of gradual, you know, but still, you know, within 20 million years of uh, sort of blowing up into 25,000 different species of just teleos fishes, which are the dominant group of fishes in freshwater and marine habitats. And that's more than all the other vertebrates combined. So uh, there are more fishes. Fishes are about half of all vertebrates, if you don't consider those vertebrates fishes too. <laughs> so, so I hope that helps. Yeah. yeah, so Prasanta, let's say you like evolution, like you specifically, and you might have just answered it, but why did you go into the study of fish versus all the other yeah. genera you could have chosen? Yeah, um, so I grew up in, in New York City in Queens. Uh, the concrete jungle. And I'd go to the Bronx Zoo and the American Museum of Natural History. And that's about as much nature as I'd get. Um, my parents who were Indian took me to India when I was eight. And then I had no idea I was a very Americanized kid. No idea that people, you know, could live where you could see all the stars, which is what, what it was like in the rural village where they lived then anyway. And uh, I fell in love even before that, I loved nature, but I really fell in love with nature then. But I thought fish were gross uh, until college. And I still, I went to McGill University in Montreal and wanted to do an internship and found an internship when I was doing my summer back home at the American Museum of Natural History. And I worked with Melanie Stiazny, who's a great ichthyologist. And, uh, 
so she made me love fishes she got me into ichthyology she got me into the crew she made me give a talk at the big ix and herps conference which i'm now president of that organization so it's her influence she's a very influential person in my life and to a lot of people and she got me to stop thinking fish were gross and, and realize how much cool anatomy there was so thanks melanie all right very good that's also a theme of our webinars people talking about how they were mentored so the last question is from demi a lot of our our hope for our ties webinars is that teachers play sections of them in their classroom where they assign webinars. So for students who are leaving high school and they have a passion of like a specific animal or plant or fungi and they want to go into evolution and they need experience to get experience, what what are some uh, recommendations of like how to get in? How to get in? Well, so, um, you know, like students who want to be doctors, shadow doctors, or nurses, or dentists, whatever, um, I would say it's first thing is to go to a museum, to go to a zoo, to go to a place where evolutionary biology is being done or, or zoology is being done and work. And so I worked at the Brooklyn Aquarium, you know, because I was the, you know, I was a volunteer docent where I just talked about the animals. But that was, you know, part of the first experiences that I had. And getting that experience led to more experiences. And so um, sometimes there's some low level jobs that you can do. Um, there are often uh, calls for volunteers or, or, or hopefully paid positions. I think paid positions should be the only positions available, but sometimes they're volunteer. Um, and reading about people's work and then emailing those people, hey, I just read your book or your paper and I got interested in this. Do you know if there's any opportunities? And they might not have an opportunity in their lab, but maybe they know something. And so that's a, a good start and, and being patient, but also being, you know, reaching broadly to as many folks as you can, because most folks don't have positions, but somebody might know of one. And, uh, if you uh, say a nice word in the beginning of the email, uh, <laughs> saying that you read their book, that might be an, a good carrot to get them to think about you in a different way than somebody just saying, hey, do you have a job for me? Because most of us don't. I hope that makes sense. Yes. All right. One, one last question. So ties is about uh, providing the tools and the resources to teachers so they can effectively teach evolution, but also answer its critics. And can you speak to, I know you're at the college level, but do you have any pushback in Louisiana, parentheses in Louisiana, or at the college level? And if so, is there, do you have like a go-to way to teach them? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any more pushback in Louisiana than I had anywhere in, you know, when I went to grad school at Michigan and in New York. In fact, I have less, I think. And I think part of it is the context. So I'm teaching evolution. So the students, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a required class. Evolution is required of all biology majors, but they're already biology majors. So they know it's coming, but I'm not trying to make them, this, you know, this, change their mind about their belief system, right? They're gonna come in with a belief system. And so my job is just to say, this is the science of evolution. This is how we understand evolution. This is also how we understood evolution and how it's changed. And so that's my job. My job is not to convince them of one thing or another. That's their job. And so I give them the tools to convince themselves of what they may find out on their own. Because in the end, we're, we're trusting ourselves and those people that we trust. And so for me, gaining their trust is most important, not changing their mind. And so gaining their trust so that they say, okay, this person is, is showing me information uh, as best as he can uh, about what he knows and not trying to change my mind. For me, I think it's really important to know where people are coming from. I don't wanna break down their belief system in a way that they uh, don't have the foundation that they grew up with. Right. They might change uh, their view 
in the future, I might change my view in the future. And it's just based on our own understanding of, of our of our world. And so uh, the pushback, I'm always listening and I, I, you know, why they push back and where they're coming from. Because where they're coming from is more important to me. Because uh, that will help me understand what I can help them with. And it might not be uh, to change their mind today. And maybe I could plant a seed where they can learn more stuff on their own in the future. All right. Thank you so much, Prasanta Chakrabarti, for your presentation. Get his book wherever books are sold. <laughs> Congratulations to the two lucky winners. We also have our book on teaching evolution. And uh, thank you, everyone who attended live. Pencil in our other webinars so you could also win cool stuff. And thank you once again, Prasanta. Sure. Thank you. Thank you all.